What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. All right, Nightmare Success In and Out listeners, we are back. We are back. It's where you come for what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt, survive? Overcome, set yourself free. Well, I've been excited for this interview because my guest, she she is a girl on the move. I mean, if you read about it's Jacqueline Pauvli, Paul Vier, Paul Vieri. Is that how? Is that right, Jacqueline? Is that nice how you say? Close, God, I, I I can mess these things up in a heartbeat. We just started, and I've I've, I mean, it's Paul v, Paul Vieri, Paul Vieri, Paul Vieri. <laughs> Paul Viari, the, people love it when I'm I'm pronouncing names, but it's P O L V E R A R I, right? Yes, it's Paul yeah. Virari, Yes, I, we're, I not, we're not going to say your last me. name in this interview ever until the very end. <laughs> 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 well, I want to tell you a little bit about Jacqueline. <laughs> she is the founder of Evolution Reentry Services, and she has over 25 years of proven successes in mentoring and therapeutic environments and criminal justice reentry. Her experience working with trauma in the criminal justice field culminated through her personal journey of making poor choices over a decade ago that eventually she ended up in prison. She has since used her professional expertise and sociology background to dedicate herself to improving the policies and practices affecting women who are justice impacted. And she's got master's degrees to go with all this stuff in this arena. Jacqueline has focused on criminal justice advocacy reform and reentry services specializing in trauma as it relates to women and their families re relating to incarceration. She's also been a featured keynote speaker at several criminal justice and psychology conferences throughout the country. And I've heard they are very motivational uh, from people who have attended those. And uh, she was just inducted into the hall of change in Connecticut. And I'm going to have uh, Charlie Grady on here. Uh, in a couple of weeks, who uh, was a big part of that. And he's going to try to make that a national program that goes from state to state. But I love the whole idea of it and what they do. She also hosts a, a monthly podcast called Criminal Justice Cafe. I want everybody to check that out. That's Criminal Justice Cafe. Um, I can't wait to unpack all this. Before we do, I just want to recognize our show sponsor, Auto Plaza Direct. You know who likes spending a couple of weekends walking the car lot, looking for a car? Nobody likes to do that. Then you spend four or five hours in the dealership to buy a car. It's kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way. Take away all that pain and hassle getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate, they'll negotiate your best price. They also offer you warranties and financing. It's all full, full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Jacqueline, here we are. Welcome. Hi. I, I got to take a break. I got to go buy a car at Auto Plaza Direct. <laughs> <laughs> they take away all the pain and hassle. They do, right? So, How are you? So, Jacqueline, I... <laughs> When, you know, you and I talked and um, you've been through one heck of a journey and, and, and what you're doing with your life experience and, and pushing that all back in and, and using your experiences to really help other people. Can you take us back a little bit into, just so people can figure out where Jacqueline, little Jacqueline, what was her life like growing up? Mom, dad, siblings, what in the world brought Jacqueline to this point? Wow, that's a lot. This I don't think we have enough therapy sessions for that. <laughs> um, I I grew up in a middle class family. I have two older brothers. So you're, the oldest, yeah, you're the baby. Yeah, the baby of the family. My oldest yeah. brother is perfect at everything he does. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, that's an older, yeah, old, right, older sibling, right. right? Football player, baseball player, musician, anything he touches. My uh -huh. uh, my brother, my middle brother, uh, that's also older than me. He's also very talented. 
So I grew up in some pretty big shoes that I had to fill. I think they were, that was more in my head than in reality. Oh, I'm sure it was, yeah. Of course, of course. The baby, the family gets to see everything too. So they yeah. see what the older siblings are doing. Yeah. What about mom and dad? Where were they in your, in your world? Uh, well, my mother was home. Yeah. And my dad was in insurance. He yeah. um, sold insurance. He was in insurance business. He was busy a lot. He was working a lot, but he was my hero. He was like, wow. You know, every he time he, came guy. Home, he had these big dot matrix spreadsheets that, that used to print out with all oh, the yeah, leads on it. I would sit there and go through with him. <laughs> the old eighties like, where those home. things just came and just rolls and rolls and rolls and yeah. you can make like a walkway. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's I, it's kind of I played a lot of tennis. Um, yeah, a lot of tennis because it was the only sport my brothers didn't play. <laughs> so I, I found tennis and dancing were the two things I didn't do. So I did a lot of that, and then I was really an academic kind of person. Um, that doesn't surprise those, me. Yeah, one of those nerdy people with the I had the dictionary with all the I still have my dictionary with all the highlights in it. Uh huh. Stuff like that. So did you like school? I mean, if you were, if you were nerdy, was that kind of a thing that you were into high school, getting good grades? <laughs> I hated school. You hated was, school. You were a nerd uh, that hated school. Yeah, it was funny because way back then, like now the kids have so many days they have to be there or they yeah. fail. Yeah. We didn't, I never had to go to school. So I, I was one of the skippers. I used to, but I'd go to school. I would skip and just stay in the band room the whole day. <laughs> play my instrument. I play flute, and I'd show up when there was tests. So I did really well. I guess. you did really. You were a great test test taker. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I know. Or I cheated. I can't remember. It was so long well, ago. <laughs> it's, it, it was a long time ago, but the, you you got good grades. So yeah, yeah. I did. What were you thinking in high school that you were going to grow up and do? You know, it's very funny, actually. My guidance counselor told me that. Girls like me go to hairdressing school. Okay. So I did. I signed up for hairdressing school. I hated that too. I was is that like more... cosmetology? Is that what that is? Yeah. 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 It, was, it was like, you know, so I, I was so bad at it too. I was so bad that they never even called me to do anyone's hair. So <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> well, I guess that is bad if you can't yeah, do anybody's I was, hair. I was, really, I was really bad. So I, I did graduate and then I um, left and went to college. <laughs> I said, this isn't for me. So how long does that, like, cosmetology school, how long is that, a year? Yeah, I think it was like nine months or a year. And so then you ju you got done with that and you just jumped into college? Yeah, I worked one day in a salon. Okay. And I, oh, I. You said it's not for you. Yeah, it definitely was not for me. No, I didn't have any of the acumen you needed to have this, <laughs> to, to be successful in that. So you roll into college, where'd you go? I went to South Central, which is okay. a community college. It's not there anymore. South okay. Central Community College is now Gateway. Um, God, I'm dating myself. They renamed Shame it. On you, Brent, for bringing this. Up. Well, I, I I was down in my hometown, of Springfield, Missouri, uh, not too long ago uh, for this little thing, and and uh, my elementary school and junior high is gone. It's a it's a Menards now, and oh, wow. it's just they just mowed it down. It's that's when you know you've got no. It's not even there's no existence of it. It's just yeah, gone. That's my high school too. Gone. God. Absolutely gone. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, back then we had no, we didn't have to go to the Ivy League schools. You know, I was perfectly happy going to community college, taking my time, figuring things out. I worked at Smith Barney Harris Up and, and Company. My first, I loved that job. I was destined to be a stockbroker, not actually, but I in my well, mind. You thought so at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Nobody's ever asked me this. I've done millions of interviews and no one's ever asked me about this. So it's, it, it, it's, it's fun. But you liked that job. Oh, I loved it. But there were no women stockbrokers back yeah. in 1989 when the stock yeah. market poof, crashed. Mm -hmm. um, I was the assistant to the vice president in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and he was kind of my mentor. Okay. So I learned I learned everything about business, not from college, but from him. Yeah. Well, that's usually the way it is. You, yeah. you're, so the street smarts comes when you actually get into this, to the real. Yeah. 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 Um, and he was tough. He, yeah. was, he was, he was an architect by trade and then went and became a incredible, but he was an old school charter. So he charted the stocks. So wow. every night I'd have to chart the stocks for him. It was really cool. And, um, 
the Cotron 1000 ticker tape just came out. The new, you know, where we had, we could put the, we had a lot, you know, you put your things in by the wire, your yeah. settlement in by the wire, but we had the Cotron 1000. So I learned that inside and out in my geekism. And that's where my business stuff started. I that's how it started. So what yeah. was the next step from that? Oh God, marriage, right? So you got married. Yeah, yep. I got married and uh, stayed married 10 years. I had two kids that were great and I stayed married because I had two kids. Sure. And um, during that time, I really worked for myself. I had business consulting. I did a wed wedding consulting business for a while. Oh, that's a big business. Yeah. I, well, I know now. that business well that. with three daughters. Yes, that's yeah. those people. Those people really can figure things out. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. Back then, not so much though. Um, yeah. People were like, what the heck is this wedding consultant? Nobody wanted to pay me to do wedding consulting. So, uh, yeah. So I kind of just worked for myself and I worked in theater. I'm a member of the um, International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees still to this day. And I did wardrobe. Yeah. Did you ever do any acting? No, God, no. No. I took theater. I, I minored in theater in college and did you? I got, I got B's in acting and A's in directing. So I wasn't, I wasn't okay. an A actor. I did like directing though, which by the way, I think looking back on that and that directing class, and I really, really loved it. I think it's really good for business and building a business because you have to convince the audience and the actors that this is real and yeah. you, they have to see your vision and it has to come to a point where it's all believable and everybody's moving in the same direction. So I think there's something to, I think maybe every business person should take a directing class because I think there's something to it. It would be so cool. Cause we, we were this stop. If we did most of the um, design work to go to New York, cause yeah. we're, we're in New Haven. It would be so cool. Six o'clock in the morning, we'd go in and the theater would be dark by seven o'clock. It was a live show and you know, props, wardrobe, sound, carpentry, it all came together and yeah. it's just magical, really magical. I love it. Still love it. So you it. get married, really you have magical. kids. Yeah. And where did you get into the title world? Because you became the founder of this big title company. <laughs> By accident, like, actually. What, I was going what, through my divorce. So what, what happened with that? How did... Because up until that point, what we talked about, there's nothing that you've talked about with title right. or real estate or yeah. so how, how, how did you venture into that pathway? Well, I was going through my divorce. My brother had a title company. Okay. And I was going through divorce and they did notary closings. And I had my notary from Smith Barney from years yeah. ago. So yeah. I, um, I was doing that part time along with wardrobe stuff while I was figuring out the whole divorce thing. Mm -hmm. And my brother had a partner who I went to high school with and we were not the best of buds in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we just, I just I had this feeling ironically. You didn't so date him or anything. It was just, you didn't get along very well. Yeah. We were just different. And I ironically, I said to my brother one day, I think she's stealing from you. Mm. And he got really mad. And so we parted ways and I said, okay, well, this is what I know now. So I'm going to do this. And I thought. That's how it started? That's yeah. how Fusion started? Wow. Okay. Yeah. It started by accident because it was back then it was notary closings. It was just notary closings, not yeah. title searching. And my brother only worked for attorneys. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, I don't want to, you know, hurt him. So I went to title companies and got work. And, um, it was a big turmoil in my family. Huge. So, big turmoil because you guys were in the kind of the same arena. Yeah. He didn't speak to me for four years. Oh my so gosh. Was, because my, my father worked for him yeah. after he retired. And then my other brother came to work for me. Oh my gosh. So, so it, it wasn't was, a family business. It was a family competition. Yeah, it, it was. And I just kept saying, my mother was all upset about him. I said, don't worry, mom, my brother, he'll come work for me one of these days. Cause I knew it is, I knew his partner was really yeah. ripping him off kind of thing. And then two years later he came and joined us. So it, did be, it did became a family business. Yeah. 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 Way, too, way too big. Cause then my cousins, I hired, I hired everybody in the family. Yeah. Um, 
Well, the thing about a family business is that, you know, it's, it's, uh, I always kind of had, had it to, cause my brother and my dad and I were all in business together. And it was, you know, it's like being a, you know, like, uh, the Bee Gees or, or, you know, one of those bands, like who's the lead singer, you know, you have to find who, who fits what role, which it worked for us because we were all different enough that we kind of found our own lane, but yeah. it can get kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's different. Yeah. It, it really is a lot. And I didn't anticipate that. And then I was getting remarried in 2004 mm -hmm. and I then trained my husband to do title searching. So now he came as an employee as well. So I had all these employees doing title searching and closing. And the company's growing. I mean, it's, it's a big, it becomes, you know, a successful company. Um, yeah. how, how does it, how did it run into where, where did your nightmares start? <laughs> the day I opened the company. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's where it started. <laughs> no, it was really, it was growing really fast. Yeah. And I had so many people and Connecticut's laws were changing. And in Connecticut, you have to be an attorney to write mm -hmm. a title policy. So I thought, well, this is easy. I'll just go into business. I'll have an attorney join us. And I, okay. I was doing paralegal sense. work as well. So yeah. I brought an attorney in as my partner. That was where it went wrong. I gave 48% of my company to, to a, the attorney, a friend of mine. Yeah, I thought he was a friend and he was an yeah. attorney. And that didn't go over well with the fam either, um, mm. that I just gave it to him because we needed him to write the title policy. But then we did a one-stop shop. We brought in a mortgage guy and it, it was, we were doing commercials on TV that. No, I read about, I mean, it was a big company, yeah. successful company. Well, successful for maybe six months, but yeah, <laughs> you know, and success is what we we've, we've learned success is different. Than we so thought, true. So right? true. So then my success was really just making everybody proud. Yeah. I, I had a lot of father issues and I hate saying daddy issues, but so father issues. And yeah. I wanted to be number one and I wanted to be seen. And I was always not, I was always the awkward one. Mm -hmm. I was always the awkward kid. And so I just wanted to prove myself and just kept pushing and pushing. I was working so much and just pushing and pushing. But what I wasn't recognizing is. And you think, Jacqueline, what you were pushing for recognition, for credibility, for everybody to see I did it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't for me. Right. You know, you learn later in life that, you know, you do things for yourself. And right. I, I never did. I never did anything for myself. It was always to prove that I'm smart, prove yeah. that I'm, you know, and you can do it. Yeah. Prove that yeah. I could do it. And then Plus you, you would have had a lot of pressure on you too, with everybody that's involved in that business you're related to in some way that yeah, everybody's yeah. Uh, counting was, on you. It was a lot. And, and my best friend was my business manager. So that was even tougher. Yeah. And I should have recognized it when I went to get it. I had to go work at a job. So I, I became a loan officer for Wells Fargo. Yeah. And I should have thought, wow, why do I need to get a job if I own this company? <laughs> yeah. Why am I needing an extra cash flow? Yeah. 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 That didn't even, um, cause it was just that mechanism that grind every yeah. day and that sickness in your stomach. And it became something I hated. Yeah. Every day getting up, I, was sick to my stomach and um, the mortgage industry started to now decline. It was in 2008. Mm -hmm. It started to crash. The big crash. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, okay, what are we going to do? So now my partner, I had known, I was his paralegal. I had known he had been taking mortgages and not paying them off directly after they okay. closed. And he, the, back then they had prepayment penalties. So I think the thing he was doing was paying it off. He was paying it off when the prepayment penalty was done. Mm -hmm. So he made this extra amount mm -hmm. of He's money. kind of playing a gap. Yeah, because yeah, there was a dig. Now, you, yeah. now there's no ding on a – there isn't right. prepayment penalties in Connecticut. Yeah. But 
it was a lot of that. So I thought, okay, well, I have my house. I can take a mortgage out on the house and fund payroll. Mm -hmm. And I had a loan officer that was in our office who said, oh yeah, we can do this. You know, this is what you need to make. I had no idea what I made. I really had no idea. Yeah. You were just trying to get, get the job done. I don't even think my Grow the business. knew what I made. Yeah. yeah. Who, who the heck knew? So it was like a two week process. It wasn't like today. It was a no income, no verification loan. Took it out that quickly. And I funded the payroll when the money was wired in to the attorneys, um, our uh, trust account. Mm -hmm. I funded our payroll with it mm -hmm. and then thought, wow, I don't have the money now to pay the mortgage. Going forward. That's okay. I'll pay both mortgages. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay. And I did. I maintained paying both of those mortgages. And then it really imploded when he came, my attorney, the attorney came in one day and he said, I need to speak to you. And on the front page of the paper was him and some other guys in this, scam that they were doing. He said, I need to come clean. I said, well, come clean. It's on the front page of the paper. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided, okay, we got to, I got to part ways. Mm -hmm. That's it. We, we have to part ways. This is on the front page of the paper. And, yeah. and I did, I brought the title search company. We separated. He took the closing company. I took the mm -hmm. title search company Split it up. back to my house and tried to figure it out. And then um, that's when the FBI came knocking at the door. What was your thought, Jacqueline, when that happened? Were you were you thinking something like that was going to happen because he was kind of over here to the side and and you were trying to break it all up, or or was it a complete shock? I had no idea. Luckily, there was an attorney across the hallway from mm -hmm. us where we had our office, and I brought. I went in to speak to him, and he mm -hmm. said, and he actually did my LLC paperwork, and he said to me when I was giving the attorney. The 48%. Why are you doing that? Yeah, why are you doing that? Yeah. And then when I went in there, he said, I saw the paper and I already saw the paper. We know. And he's, he, that was my only saving grace because he said to me, be prepared that something's going to be coming down the pike here because they're going to start. Once that happened, he was started to be investigated with his whole. Yeah, group. they'll start digging. Right. Yeah, they start, they started digging into all his stuff. Yeah. And um, so I had that attorney that I had already been speaking with. So when the FBI knocked, I called him immediately. And he also um, had a criminal defense attorney in his office who did right by me so much. Um, That's a good thing. He, he really did. I was, I was really lucky because when I got raided, I mean, I didn't know anything about this stuff. I, I really... But quite frankly, after what, what was like, I mean, I, with that happening, Jacqueline, it wasn't just you. So your family and everything is what, what's everybody saying? Like, what's the what's the the dinner table talk about the FBI comes, knocks on the door and, and there's an investigation? Nothing. Nothing. Zip. Wow. It was. And, and I never recognized that until way later yeah when you you know when you finally can breathe and you start thinking about what yeah. what happened nothing was said nothing no what happened are you okay what's going on i'm nothing no chatter um just i'll you know we're standing here for you that's it not even recognize it that maybe they had a part in it yeah nothing so the investigation how long does this thing last let's see my crime was in 2009 i didn't plead guilty and my plea agreement was in 2012 for three years yeah and then i didn't surrender till 2015 wow what a long time yeah so were you on pre-trial for what over it's three years it was five years it's a yeah. long time. I was on pre-trial for three years and I thought that seemed like a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was a lot. And I was working with the FBI because the attorney I had at the time said, you know, if there's anything that you have that is not on your computer, you need to let us know now. Mm -hmm. You can help yourself a little. What did I have? I had Wells Fargo. Yeah. So I, they were doing robo signing at the time. So that was a big thing back then. Mm -hmm. And um, sign, signing 
doing mortgage assignments and they were robo signing them prior and had piles of them. Mm -hmm. So I was compiling all these assignments that were robo signed from, I thought I was going to bring Wells Fargo down when an idiot I was. <laughs> but, uh, so what, what was there when it, when it got down to the nitty gritty of it, what did, what were they, what were they charging you with? I originally had, I think it was six counts. Yeah. I think. I don't even remember how many counts because originally because I owned the business right. with my partner, everything he did, it was all we weren't co defendants. Right. But they, it they was deemed it as a kind of a conspiracy. Conduct. Yeah. 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 And, and it was considered relevant conduct. So I ended up pleading guilty to what I did yeah. and a closing that I knew what was going on with, and I actually was the notary on. So I pled guilty to two counts of bank fraud and um, then went to get sentenced. And the funny thing is when you get sentenced. Did you ever consider Jacqueline in that whole process of things? Were you always thinking I'm going to plea or were you thinking when you first got into it, did you think I'm going to try to fight my way out of this? Or did you think, no, I've, I've got to figure out how to get out of this and plea as quickly as possible. Yeah. Now I immediately, um, the first meeting, my attorney said, we have a meeting and that's when I knew that I was being charged. Mm -hmm. They put my mortgage in front of me and I said, yeah, I did that. Absolutely. I did not even waver. And I felt kind of, which I think is interesting because in that moment, you just explained it before you got into this, yeah. you took your, your, your house to pay for the payroll. They call that money laundering, but in a entrepreneur's world, you're thinking, I've got to fix this. I've got to make this work. And then you later find out that that's a really bad word <laughs> and, and, right. and it's a federal crime. And, and the, you know, the, some of those things are just like, you know, when they, they hit you across the face, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Well, it was bad because what I didn't even take into consideration, if I had played that game that I knew I would never play, uh, they they could have charged my family with money laundering, every one of them. Yeah. Which is, they did say to me, you know, because what I did say is, look, I did this. Mm -hmm. I will tell you everything that happened, but my family is not culpable to any of this. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we can charge them with money laundering. And I said, well, do you really want to put my parents in mm -hmm. prison for money? They had no idea what was going on. Right. They just, nor did they care, quite frankly. They just yeah. wanted their paycheck. And that's sad when I think about it. But it's the truth. I had so much burden on me yeah. that I was grateful to get out of it. Yeah. Did you, um, when they came to you with the plea, did they have like a range that they were giving you that it's probation to this or it's this to this? No, because I was working with them. Yeah. So I was getting this 5K, K5, I forget what they call it, letter okay. that is for cooperating. Okay. I thought it was going to be more than, because like I said, I really thought I was, I was going to bring Wells Fargo down and yeah. I um, was giving them a lot of the robo signing stuff. But in reality, it was the lower line people at Wells Fargo, the people at the top, they just right. said they didn't know anything. Yeah. Um, but the notary, everybody who robo signed it prior to mm -hmm. it were the ones who got in trouble. But so I really didn't even, my attorney kept saying to me, you do have exposure. Now, I didn't mm -hmm. know what that meant. Yeah. I thought exposure, people are going to know. Yeah. And he did say, you're going to have some prison time. And I, I, was like, How was it? I thought, no, that's not possible. Right. I'm paying my mortgage. I didn't take, right. like in my mind, I was paying it. I wasn't, I didn't steal any money. I took a mortgage mm -hmm. on my house and I was paying that mortgage. Right. The thing is my name wasn't on the house. Okay. The house was only in my husband's name when I did the mortgage and yeah. signed his name to it. And the crazy thing was not one person ever asked to speak to my husband when I did this mortgage. Wow. That's how reckless the yeah. mortgage industry was back in the Yeah. It was crazy. It was a wild, wild west then. Yeah. Yeah. People get in two or three houses and there's, you know, no money down and yeah. yeah. Crazy world. Yeah. It was, it was so hard. Jacqueline, you, you go to sentencing and what do they say? Well, I had, um, 
Judge Janet Von Archerton, who was very fair in Connecticut. I, I got a great pull, I guess. There's this, you, you know, you pull whatever. And she was tough. She was, she was fair, mm -hmm. but she really made me think and shamed me. Yeah. You know, you have a family because my family came to the sentencing. Yeah. You know, they looked supportive behind mm -hmm. me and you have a family. Look at your education. You have children. Shame on you. You should have known better. And what do you say to that? I should have. So mm -hmm. how do you explain when you're feeling less than to someone? You how old were your daughters at the time? My son was... My son's the oldest. Okay. And my two daughters were in, I think they were all in high school. Okay. At my sentencing, I think they were all in high school. Okay. Um, when and I, what was, what was their take on all this? They didn't have, they didn't understand why my family didn't help before. Like, I remember my son saying to me, I don't understand this mom. And I sat them down immediately and I yeah. was very honest with them because and I think that's helpful. I think that's why you are so good. At, Cause I want to get into that too. And what you do now is, is there's, uh, there's, you know, there's two ways to handle it. One is to act like nothing's going on and yeah. put it in a closet. And then all of a sudden it blows up like a nuclear bomb or there's another way to help them understand what's going on yeah. so that they can deal with it. Cause you know, that, they they have to deal with once you know you and I talked about this on the phone the yeah. other day when somebody goes to prison the whole family goes to prison so everybody handles that differently and how a parent handles that situation is so difficult because like you said it's it's a uh, you know there's so much there's is the weight of the world is what you're yeah, dealing with I think that's true too and I think it's so different because you have a, a dad going or a mom going I think yeah. for a mom it may be a little bit more, it's more emotional yeah. because I'm the one who made the breakfast, the lunches, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, it was, um, but I just said, and look, I'm imperfect. I, mm -hmm. I never use the word mistake because I believe in free choice. I, I in free will. I made really bad choices mm -hmm. and those bad choices were on me. Yeah. And I tried to really push that it had nothing to do with them. It's kind of like, when I went through my divorce many years ago, telling your little kids, this yeah. you know, it has nothing to do with it. It was really, it was tough. And yeah. I think what's tougher is that they loved me anyway. I expected anger. I ex mm. Even with my husband, I expected anger. I expected lash out. I didn't get that. I got support and understanding. Support. Yeah. And it's funny because kids, Kids see things, I think, more than we realize. Mm -hmm. My kids saw how my family toxicity was. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I thought it was normal because I grew up in it. Sure. But then when I parented, I wanted so badly to parent different that yeah. they only saw at holidays and, and so forth. So they really saw, you know, at a holiday when I never spoke. And they're like, mm -hmm. Mom, what's that about? Because I was always put down. If I said anything, it was wrong. It was... Mm -hmm. You know, so I learned not to really try to overshadow anybody at a dinner table with, with family. But um, it was crazy because the things my kids in and my husband told me, my husband, because he was my second husband, I met my first husband when I was 15. So he knew my family toxicity, but my husband didn't really. Yeah. Because we had gotten married in 2005 mm -hmm. and he didn't really know the childhood stuff and my kids were just very shockingly insightful. Yeah. And I learned more from them than I do from a lot of people, just some of the things that they've come out with that like, make yeah. Them, you know, I think that's great that you had that situation and a husband and the kids that were supportive. So you find out, um, a sentencing that you're going to go to prison. And I can't remember, Jacqueline, was it a year? Year and a day. Year and a day. Okay. I didn't understand that day. So I didn't know. Well, that was a good thing. Well, she gave me a for, for those, for those who are, if you get a year, uh, that's different than a year and a day because a year and a day, I think ends up being about eight months, a year, you got to serve yeah. a year. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's actually a good thing. Well, before we get into that, cause I want to, I want to go into your strategies of how you went into that unfamiliar primitive world, but I want to recognize, uh, 
the white collar support group, uh, show sponsor, uh, nightmare success is sponsored by the night or the uh, white collar support group, the world's first support group devoted to people navigating the white collar criminal justice system. I'm a member of the white collar support group. And I can tell you that it is a bunch of people who help each other through the criminal justice journey for free. Whether you're just starting your journey or you made it through to the other side, this is a great space for you. You can join us on Zoom Mondays, 7 p.m. Eastern Time or 4 p.m. Pacific. For information, go to prisonist.org. That's prisonist.org. Start here. So, Jacqueline, you get sentenced a year and a day. Um, walk me through that. You know, I'm, you voluntarily surrendered to a place. What's yeah. going through your mind? A year and a day. And all, you know what went through my mind? All I heard in the entire courtroom was my husband crying. I mm. never heard him cry before. Mm. And my kids weren't crying because they also never heard him cry before. And that's all I heard. And then I heard my attorney and I had a different attorney at sentencing. I heard him say, do not cry. And I didn't understand that. So I just. He said, it. you don't cry. Yeah. He okay. He said it to me and I just stood there frozen. I didn't quite know about any of it because it's mm -hmm. all so surreal. Yeah. Um, and there was nothing back in 2015 to even prep me for what was about to happen or what mm -hmm. emotionally I could feel. So I didn't know what to feel. I didn't know if it was, you know, kind of numb. Know. Yeah. And I still hadn't gone to any therapy at all and dealt with any of the toxicity that I mm -hmm. had gone through. And, um, I just stood there and then afterwards, I remember consoling my husband mm. and him saying, and I was like, look, I'm okay. I need for you to be okay. Cause you're the rock. He is, yeah. he's a rock to us. Yeah. And, um, I don't really remember a lot of it after it, it was so emotional and draining and it felt so good to have it over. Mm -hmm. It just, what, what I thought was over. Yeah. You know, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to just go do these seven, eight months. And, yeah. and that is a mindset. You want to get it over. Yeah. Once you know you're going in, it's like, you know, I, I think I had a dead period of like from November until January 14th. And, you know, that's such a weird time period. Cause you know, you go, I went through the holidays and yeah. Christmas and, and the whole thing just felt like I was a dead man walking. I just wanted to get it over or get it started to get it over. Yeah. It is same with me. Cause I went through the holiday. They, they gave me a choice if I wanted to go prior to Christmas or after. And I, yeah. I surrendered January 5th, 2015. Yeah. Um, so it, it's weird because you almost think you're, it's like there's a death coming because it's, it's my last Christmas, it's, but it's yeah. really not, you know, and I try and tell people that this is your first Christmas yeah. um, of the, you know, first Christmas of being healthy. Yeah. And you don't feel that way. I just felt everything was the end and it was my last. Well, and I think a lot of it too, Jacqueline is because you're going into a world that is so unfamiliar and you know nothing about it. And because it's the unknown, your mind makes it out to be a monster. And, and I always tell people, you know, nothing is as bad as your mind makes it out to be, not even prison. That's right. And, you know, that, what, that thing that starts going into your mind of that fear of the unknown gets so big. And, yeah. you know, for me, my biggest surprise was, was, was walking in there and, and seeing how many people within the first 30 to 45 minutes were trying to help me in this yeah. new world I was in. Right. It's crazy. It, it's really, it, I took Krav Maga classes before prison because I had no idea. I thought for sure I'm going to have to defend myself. I've never gotten into an altercation in my life. Yeah. And now I'm going to have to, you know, I, I, mean, I can't dance around somebody. What am I going to do? Right. Um, and it was funny because walking into that environment the first time, all I saw was chaos. Yeah. It was just a bunch of normal women Chaos and, and a bunch coming up to me saying, yeah. taking the things out of my hands, saying, let me help you. Let me show you where it was. There was no bars or locks or it was quite ridiculous in my mind mm -hmm. because once I got there and 
I did intake, the guard said to me, okay, the camp's up there. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, well, what do you mean up there? And it was winter. <laughs> Back then yeah. it snowed. It doesn't snow in Connecticut anymore. <laughs> it was winter. And I said, you mean up there? And I thought it was a joke. And he said, no, take all your stuff and start walking. I did. It, yeah. I walked up this huge, big hill and there was this like building that was, it looked just like all you could see is the windows mm-hmm. and you could see it was a basement and that was the camp. Mm. And you walk into, it was a really long building, very small, but long. Yeah. And I walked in and it looked like a grammar school. You know, the floors of a grammar school that yeah. tiny. And I walked in and all I said was a long hallway and that's it. Jacqueline, it's so funny that you say that because what, like Leavenworth, you know, the penitentiary was 1879 and looks like Shawshank Redemption. Down the hill, this place... You know, this was one of those, I think there's only three camps that had fences around it. This is one of them. But inside that fence, it looked like an old rundown elementary schoolhouse. Yeah. It, it was really run down, but that's what it looked like. It looked like you, an elementary school that had been, you know, neglected for 50 years, but yeah. it did not look like, it didn't look yeah. like the penitentiary. No, not, yeah, yeah, because I self-surrendered to the big, huge. Yeah, they, that's what they do. They scare you to death, put you in the locked yeah. in place for a while. And then you don't, then, then you know that you don't know anything and you, if they put you in there forever, there's nothing you can really say. And then they finally come get you. What are you going to do? Yeah. yeah. Study. I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. That's what everybody says. Yeah. And, and that's a hard thing too, because the minute you walk through those doors, your control is gone. So you're, gone. You're really Such gone. a weird, I always say it almost feels like your freedom feels like it's like, like coming off your skin. You know, yeah. you're prisonized as you go through that intake and it's like, it just falls off of you that, that freedom. It's, it's a weird phenomenon to lose your freedom and know you have no more control. Yeah, it is. And especially for someone in the financial crime space, because that's all it's about is control. Yes. You need to control everything. Yeah. And when you don't have that control, it can go two ways. You can really just bunker in and figure out what happened, or you could be one of those, okay, let's write administrative remedies and fight everything. Those are the only two Mm -hmm. um, things that I've seen in the past 10 years that happen. Yeah. And um, I was not going to be there long enough to cause problems and I didn't want to write remedies and I did write one or two, but um, (laughs) I just wanted to get it done with. (laughs) So how did you handle it? Like, what did you do when you were there? What do you do? I, I, I surrendered with Teresa Judice. So the day I surrendered, of course, there's all media out in front. My attorney calls and he says, I'll tell you when to go because, you know, her publicist or whatever was going to let him know. So I wasn't going anywhere the same time she was because it was so much media mm-hmm. outside the prison. And she self-surrendered at like five in the morning or four. In the Wait, morning. who was this? Teresa Judice. Oh yeah, the New the uh, uh, yeah. I have a problem guys... with her, so okay. I'm gonna call that out right now. She <laughs> does not make muffins in prison. I have to say, <laughs> I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, she was a big deal going in yeah, there. Yeah, she, she she was a big deal, and um, at the time, and so when I went, uh, didn't I, they have the split uh, deal where she served her time, and then her husband then served, and then he got, I think, deported. Uh, deported. To yeah. Italy or whatever. Yeah, that was yeah. something else. Yeah, she just came out with something in People Magazine that it was the one of the, it was the best, the nicest place she's been. The grounds were beautiful. She made banana nut muffins for the camp. And she, and she made, didn't. You know, and then in 2016, she said it was hell and there was maggots in the food. Okay. So who knows? You know, she, she, she did not. She never, never cooked anything. Right. It, it, it really, I think for me, I got so frustrated. I was tweeting and stuff at her because- don't glamorize prison. Yeah. Why? Because you have a cookbook out. You're now going to use those women. Not even that. I think it's, you know, these daughters are looking at you Mm -hmm. and you're telling them their mother is in that prison Mm -hmm. having a good time. Right. And I really kind of went off the rails for a week. (laughs) So I realized what am I doing? Yeah. (laughs) Um, It's, it's the glamorization, the sensationalism of, 
of prison that people love and it's not sensationalized and it's not glamorized and all it's definitely not glamorous yeah it's very humbling very humbling and those every family member who has a loved one incarcerated is my hero Mm -hmm. and people say well why do you say that because they are doing prison with you and they've done nothing wrong yeah and they're on the outside having to deal with it i you know i i didn't really I, I selfishly, you know, going into prison, it was, I was thinking, cause I remember the night before I went in, Julie and I went up and we could see like the sun was going down and the guys were walking the fence line and you could kind of see inside. I didn't say anything to Julie, but I was thinking, Oh my God, that's, I'm going to be in there tomorrow and it's not going to be for a week, but I've got a five year sentence. That's going to be me tomorrow night in one of those bunk beds. But then as I was in and I realized what was going on while I was in and I was, I was, I was functioning and, and got into my own world. I was thinking how hard it was for Julie on the outside that she was living this life. She, and she, she, she gave a good analogy that, you know, like Christmases and holidays and birthdays, it's like having somebody that's in the hospital that's sick. You can go to those functions, but you're always thinking about the person that's in prison. So that it's just a, it's a whole different type of, yeah. of prison that they're in on the outside. And I didn't really start thinking about that until I was actually in prison thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to be okay here, but they're the ones that are dealing with some stuff all the time. That's so different. Yeah. Well, yeah. that makes you a really good guy. Cause I can tell you, there's not a lot of people. I was very selfish when I was there. I didn't recognize that at first. I, I didn't recognize it at all. I just was, you know, called my husband. I need this. I need this. I need <laughs> I need money on my books. books. Yeah, yeah. The kids were fighting over who could see me and have alone time with me. Yeah. And yeah. For all, I, I was very selfish because thinking back, even more thinking back at the kids were fighting to see who could be alone with me and visiting. Mm-hmm. But I was frustrated because yeah. they were fighting and I couldn't, I mean, they were, it, two of them were, they're all in college actually at that point. Yeah. And it was a lot. Visiting is a lot. And instead of it's stressful. Them, yeah, I just, um, I we had a couple of times where the, 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 I think I told you this, Jacqueline, where the visiting cops, she just decided that when the got halfway full, the visiting room, she just turned people away. Yeah. It's okay. If somebody lives around there, but for Julie and the girls, they drove four and a half hours to get there. And twice that happened where she just said, ah, not today. Yeah, that was the only. He doesn't have enough points when obviously I did. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And that's the only altercation I had in prison was over that because my family visited me. Only my husband and my kids visited me every week. And I lived an hour from the prison. So I had a really good friend that inside whose family was in Maine. So they were four hours, five hours from the prison. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in visiting and they had gotten there and they got turned away. So I got up and I said, no, we'll, we'll leave. And I got yelled. I got in trouble for that. I got in trouble for offering to leave. And Mm -hmm. he was upset. You're trying to take control of the situation and solve the problem. You can't. Yeah. There's no Mm -hmm. common sense to it, but yet the women expected me to, and there was a few that just stopped speaking to me because they thought that it was unfair that my, and, and it was unfair. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, prison has so many ridiculous rules. Yeah. So Jacqueline, you get, you start to get close to the door. Cause that's kind of the thing that happens. You get, first you get, you know, you go in and you don't know what to expect. And then you get used to the routine, even though you hate the routine, you get used to the routine. Then you start getting close to the door and is you get kind of like a little weird. So what, what were you thinking? What, like, what were you thinking? I'm getting out of here and I'm going to do what? Cause you've done so much. Did you plan that? No, no, not at all. I didn't have a clue. I just wanted to go home. I planned to go. I, I mean, my title search business was sustained yeah. and I had shrank it down and my older daughter was over. It was kind of running itself. So it was mm-hmm. still working. So I was going back. To work to that. Yeah. and had to catch up on all the accounting for a year of counting, you know, but I didn't 
factor in the fact that I was going to a halfway house. Mm -hmm. So the transitions from a federal prison camp to a halfway house is dramatic. And it is. I guess people that couldn't understand when I say it, but it is a harsher prison yeah. in a halfway house. There's more rules. There's stricter mm -hmm. guidelines. And Much more locked down. Yeah. Again, an hour from my house. So I would drive home every day to work and then drive back at night to sleep because we were allowed, federal was allowed to have their cars mm -hmm. at the halfway house where state could not. And it was state and federal, although federal could not have cell phones. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't, I've never even heard of a federal state halfway house. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. We had boats. It was federal on the first floor and the rest of the house was state. Okay. And, um, and so every day I would drive home and I thought, how does this make sense? Yeah. Financially, how does it make sense? Emotionally, how does it make sense? And again, so you come home and you're expecting to be able to have a life and it's mm -hmm. not. So you go through the halfway house and then you transition again to mm -hmm. go home mm -hmm. into home confinement, which yeah. again has different roles. So right. you have rules in prison, you have rules in the halfway house, then you're going to. You and know, all of it gives you PTSD because at any time they tell you we can jerk you back in because you're still under BOP custody. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's not that I had one author write about me in his book saying that I acted the victim mm. because I said there's PTSD, but it has nothing to do with being a victim. I'm not a victim mm -mm. of the system at all. I created my own situation and I, it's not that it's that the system is broken mm -hmm. for anyone, not just me or anybody that's there. There's no rehabilitation or emotional support right. that, that you can give to people to help them succeed. It's as, almost as if you're set up to fail, not to succeed. Sure. So it was, for me, it was a backward thinking kind of, so, you know, I got through all of that and then I go to the three year probation mm -hmm. and I had a great probation officer. She, I mean, I don't really go out that much anyway. So I didn't travel that much. It was, it was easy to do mm -hmm. probation with her because she was fair and I didn't ask of anything except I work from home. So yeah. I just want to work and um, got through that. And that's when the hard stuff started. Mm. You know, and that's what I tell people today. Prison's easy. Mm -hmm. It's after. All the reentry. Yeah. Because and that's where you're doing all the good work. So Jacqueline, where did you, I mean, because I mean, if you look on this, I mean, how many different organizations you're involved in? There's a whole sheet that I printed out here, you know, that you're involved in all these different, what, what went on? Did your brain just turn into, I'm, I'm going to start just step in action steps and, and get into re-entry. I'm going to be an advocate. I'm going to change things. I'm going to help people. I'm going to be a, what, yeah. what happened? No, I, I, the day I left Danbury, I remembered saying all along when you're there, people say, I'm going to change things. I'm going to help change things. Sure. And when you leave, it, it was a weird thing because I cried, not because I was happy to leave. I cried because the women I was leaving there, that yeah. were good people left them on the battlefield. Yeah. Right. And I knew a, the summer was, you know, it was a hundred and something degrees there. We had no air conditioning and I yeah, knew we didn't either. older <laughs> women, they couldn't breathe, right? They, it's, yeah. It gets hot. It, it's hot. And it was a 73 year old woman. They had just brought in two days before I left. Mm. Uh, mm. So I remembered that promise and the desperation letters. And I really I went to therapy and I thought I had my, my master's in social work from mm -hmm. way before. And I thought, well, this therapist can't help me. She doesn't have a clue what you've been through, what I'm going through. And I started Googling and looking up things and I found, um, Jeff Grant's, um, white collar support, white -collar support group. Yeah. And I started in 2015, slowly going to those meetings and I met up, Jeff lived in Connecticut. So yeah. For, and with Jeff, anybody check out Jeff Grant. I can't remember what episode it is. It was April last year, but he's phenomenal story. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really, and it was the support group was very different back then. It was smaller. It was, 
um, more after it was re-entry more than pre, today. I think it's more pre-trial, but then I, it, I think it probably is. There's there, there's a there's a uh, kind of a combination, but I think it weighs more towards pre-trial. I think the thing that's interesting is is that you guys in Connecticut, there's a whole bunch of you that are like this re-entry world of people that are really doing a lot. Do you think it's just? I mean, I, I'm just thinking of people I've had on like Lewis Reed and you and Jeff Grant and. Uh, I mean, I, 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 sh I shouldn't even start naming names because there's so many different people that have, yeah. that have um, been in that area that have yeah. really done a lot. Well, Lewis Reed actually has done the most for me than any person because he showed up, mm. you know, and that's the biggest thing after when you're home. Yeah. Um, you meet people that are going through it. You talk to them, you connect with them, but it's the people that show up for you when you're in your time of need. Yeah. And that makes all the difference to me. Mm -hmm. And I think I slowly started, what happened was it was started with my notary, my notary public. I was a notary public since Smith Barney mm -hmm. and my renewal for my notary came up and I just sent it in and they came back and they wanted it. This is after I came home. Yeah. They were going to charge me because they said I lied on the renewal one of the questions was, have you ever been convicted of a crime as to moral turpitude that had to do with your notary public? And mm -hmm. I answered, no, mm -hmm. not thinking. Cause it had nothing to do with my notary it had nothing to do with um, right. different said, charge. No, your crime right. was moral turpitude, right? The moral turpitude. Yes. It, but I was confused at it. So they denied me that. And I chose to go to a hearing mm -hmm. and that I was told, well, you know, you can get charged for perjury and that's a state crime. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to fight this anyway. And I had a hearing on it and Lewis Reed showed up and I fell apart during that hearing. That's crying. And, and he stepped right in and he said, judge, may I? Because I think I called the prosecutor a liar and I was, I was really upset. And he said, this is what PTSD looks like. Mm. This is what trauma looks like. And that was the first time anybody really showed up for me. And I thought he is doing amazing things mm -hmm. and I want to be like him, mm -hmm. <laughs> but how do you be a Lewis Reed? Nobody can, right? Nobody like is. Martin. He's, he's yeah, the rock star of the, yeah. Glenn Martin. You can't, yeah. I mean, Glenn is like my, uh, my mentor now. And I just, yeah. uh, but you, you meet people along the way and that white, so the white collar support group, I met, incredible people that I am so friendly with today, but mm -hmm. Connecticut, I have to give us a lot of credit because Connecticut really gives us a second. I don't want to say a second chance. They give us grace. Mm. They I allow like that word grace to make mistakes without, and they, they really do. I mean, I have been welcomed home. I went back to Albertus Magnus college and I get emotional with it because I got my master's at Fordham mm -hmm. and for social work and they denied me because I have a felony for my master's in criminal justice. Mm. I got denied from a lot of uh, four or five different, three, maybe I don't remember, but mm -hmm. so many different universities I applied to. Albertus didn't even have it on. The question wasn't there. Mm. And so I was able to go back into the criminal justice program there, but I should say, I learned about transparency from Jeff. It was different people. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2000, I wasn't going to be transparent. This was never my plan. Yeah. So in 2016, Jeff said to me, oh, in 2016, Jeff said to me, um, why don't you write a blog mm. for my, for my group? And I group. said, yeah. I said, no way, I can't write a blog. He said, I, I think it'll be good for you. So I, mm -hmm. I wrote it and I emailed it to him and he said, this sucks. He <laughs> He's so honest. He's like, no, I, this is, I want a true, honest blog. Like yeah. I told my story. He goes, this, this, what are you telling this story? I want to know, be, be vulnerable. Yeah. I was never able to do that. I'm not good at that because... I had so much toxicity around feeling. We didn't do emotions and feelings. And yeah. you know, And I wrote my first um, blog for him and it said, uh, you know, how I survived Danbury Federal Prison. And I'm like, okay, it's out there. And I was terrified because 
you know Jeff, he doesn't do anything small. So <laughs> it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I never asked my kids or my husband how they felt about it. Again, mm -hmm. I was being selfish. And I thought, okay, the world didn't come, come crashing down around me. I knew I wanted to do one thing. I never wanted to live my life ever again with having to look behind my shoulder ever. Yep. I, I like wanted that. to walk in truth yep. and own my story. And so, yeah, the, and, they, and they, that gives you the power back. You know, you take the power away from the people. Yeah. When, when you stand it's, out in front of it. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're imperfect mm -hmm. and I was very imperfect. <laughs> um, you know, so how do you take that imperfection and turn it into not having people judge you for that imperfection or those poor choices, mm -hmm. not having people, you know, I had issues with my neighbors, big issues with my neighbors. And I decided that I was forgiving them all. Mm -hmm. Anybody who had wronged me for me, I was going to have a clean slate. Just to give them space in your head. Yep. I love that. Yeah. And Lewis helped me with that as well. And I just let it go. And I said, okay, what do I want to do? And then I just, who knows, right? Bren, you've been here. How long have you been home? Uh, seven years now. Okay, seven years, right? Seven yeah, it's, years. it's flown by. And how did you know? You, did you think, oh, I'm going to have this great podcast? No. 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 It's one step. And I love it. Yeah, right? It's like, right? It's one it's like step a passion of mine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. You meet so many incredible people in the stories. And I don't know, one step. It's it's that old, what is it? The uh, Santa Claus movie, one step after another. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think it's, I, what I think is so, it's fascinating because Evolution Reentry Services is, is all about taking a hold of and it, even you even talk about specializing in trauma and, and then it, families relating to the incarceration it's it's stuff that needs to be talked about because it's all in there and so many people hold it back in but i think what you're doing what i, I think oh, i just know jacqueline what you're doing is you're you're giving them a voice to get it out and to heal and to breathe and to deal with this it is trauma. Yeah. But you know what, Brent? They, every woman I've met did more for me than I've ever done for them. Sure. The family group was where it really, I told, we talked about this. Yeah. I, 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 there's never been a family group. But my daughters wanted to talk about it. Yeah. So we did a podcast with Jeff. It was me, my two daughters, and Jeff. And um, my little one was going to, she got her master's in criminal justice with me. That's awesome. Alberta. And so, I thought, why isn't there any support groups for families? Yeah. So I started one. And that first support group, I sat there and I get emotional. I cried because I thought, this is what I did to my family. Mm. And I never saw it until that meeting. That's I when it all more, came. Yeah. I learned more from those families than I could possibly. Like daughters and spouses and thinking these beautiful people who are supporting their loved ones are frozen in time. Yeah. Afraid to have a good time. Right. Afraid to, not afraid, but. It don't feels awkward. Their, yeah, yeah. Their loved one by enjoying themselves. Yes. And then I sat and had the real conversation with my husband. Is this how you, I never asked him how he felt. Mm -hmm. And he, we always we're, we got really close while I was, I thought we got really close when I was in Danbury, but really he was getting closer to me mm -hmm. in a different way mm -hmm. because he was the supporting one. Yeah. I had always been the supporting one. Yeah. So now my mind just after that first meeting was, I thought this is. Yeah, you were sold. Yeah. This is a good thing this to do. Was missing yep. is the family piece. And it's. It's That's amazing really how you good. find things like that and it just fills you up. You know, I, yeah. I had a guy that, um, he was, he'd been out for a week and a half and he emailed me and he 
he said, I read your book in prison and I did a book report on it. And he said, it really helped me. And he said, I just want to reach out to you. He said, I just got home. I'm getting, you know, now this second step of my journey. And um, we ended up talking and you know, it's things like that, that really are like, I'm so happy that he took that and was able to use it because we have our journeys there. Yeah. You know, the, the common line is we go through a nightmare, how we survive that nightmare has different storylines to it. But yeah. um, I think it's so great when someone like you, Jacqueline will take that overall experience that you have you've and you've had a wonderful brain all throughout but you're using that in such a positive way to help people and you know one of the things i find you know talking to different people is is that there's so many good things going on all across the country but really there's no dots that are connected and if one of these times we could just make it all connect so that it's like creates this tidal wave of, of good for reentry. It'd be a wonderful thing. Yeah. It, yeah. It's funny because when I spoke to you, I think you had said something about Lynn and I said, Oh my God, Lynn and I've been friends for a while. And then yeah. I've been friends with Lewis for a while. And then I'm friends with Glenn and, and, yeah. Clover and, and it's funny because you meet all these connections and I've come together with them all, not in one space, well, a few of them I have. But in different spaces. In, yeah. in different spaces. And especially, I think, with the re-entry organizations, mm -hmm. there's this sense of competition that saddens me. It, yeah. it really does. And I'm now collaborating. So, you know, there's this group in Nevada called Prison Families Alliance. Okay. Brent, it's amazing. Where is it? In Nevada. And okay. And they have, they, that's all they do is family support groups and they do them every day of the week. They do them in person and they do them on zoom and they have different types of, they have sibling meetings. They have, I like that. Yeah. yeah. They even have, um, so it's not, staff. it's not just in Nevada. They're, they're able to, to reach out wherever. Yeah. And then, um, they have one meeting where all you do is write mm -hmm. and share your writings. And I met Julia who, um, was the co-founder of this maybe five years ago. And her and I have always, she's called me quite a bit. We've tried to connect and I just haven't, but now that I'm getting so, so the company is getting larger. I, I don't want to ever make the mistakes I've made. So I started to collaborate with other companies to pick I love up that. Yeah. and have the beliefs. I believe in the values. I believe sure. in. Yeah. So she's picking up the family um, group. And I know she's got 14 facilitators that are amazing and I know that the families will be in the best support space. Yeah. And it's still going to be the same time through my yeah. website, the same thing. And then the women's support group, I collaborated with a beautiful heart ministries. Who's my friend mm -hmm. Clover. And she also is, does amazing things. Mm -hmm. And so she started a, a women's support group. So I've collaborated with her to move the support. I love that you're doing that to her I and think. collaborating is a way to connect the dots. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to make it bigger in a way that it doesn't have to compete. I love that. Right. Right. And lifting each other up because I think there's yes. a lot of, it's great. It's in any space where people are trying to make money when money's involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pretty raw, especially in that. something like this. Yeah. And, and then know, it really gets weird. Yeah. And it's weird because you come home and you're more, I'm much more comfortable speaking to you in this space than mm -hmm. I am. I spoke the other day at the, um, we're trying to pass some legislation for title searching to be licensed mm -hmm. in Connecticut. I was so uncomfortable, but yet I'm an expert at title. Sure. And I was uncomfortable, but in this space here, I'm more comfortable because it's a community that I know yeah. welcomes me in that space. I had to lead with, all right, this is, you know, this is my background because if I didn't lead with that, somebody would have came back later. And well, and I, I think again, Jacqueline, by leading with it, because there's only two ways to go with it. There's yeah. one, you just you try to hide it and hope that nobody finds out, which is almost impossible nowadays because they can Google and do whatever. But yeah. the other is, is to lead with it. You take the power of it. Whoever was going to bring it up or make a big issue, you lead with and tell them how or what and when, and then it's out there and then you can move forward. Right, right. Yeah, it, but it you own it. it. It is true. It's yours. It's such a weird thing for me because le my name is legally, my last name is 
Purcell. I never changed it. Purcell would be so much easier to say. Right? I know. And I, I just, because I got married, you know, you get married, you, 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 yeah, yeah, you yeah. need to change it. You're taking, you know, and so the court. I still don't know how if I'm just going to say Paul Viaria. Paul Viaria. Paul Viaria. Still not saying it right. Um, so it's kind of a weird thing for me because my company, they know me as Purcell and it's like, wow, I got to combine these names somehow. And then everything on Google, it, it's just a weird thing. And um, so I, I lead with it anyway. I love that. People couldn't find it because I mean, I was on the front page of the Connecticut newspapers about this title searching thing. And I said to the reporter, I said, look, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to put this in, you need to put that. I know fraud because I committed fraud. Yes. Or else you're going to have people discredit. They're going to say, hey, that's that girl. Yeah. And I would never want a reporter to do a story yeah. to me and not be blindsided. But Jacqueline, tell me a little bit about this, this, um, the Hall of Change. Because I think um, the more I read about it, the more I think that it's so great that that's providing an incentive for people that are doing good work. And then they're getting recognized. And, you know, you've got a board that recognizes this and all these different yeah. people that are involved. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You're yeah, in there now. It is, yeah. It's Connecticut Hall of Change. Um, Charlie Grady, who um, works for the FBI. He's yes. Actually, going to be retiring, I think, this year. Going to have him on the show. It's going to be the yeah. first time I had somebody on from the FBI. Oh, uh, he's what? Let me tell you, it's funny. Because and he's a 20 year uh, actor. Right, right. And he looks big films crazy. and yeah. soap operas. It's crazy. I mean, this guy, this is like, they should do a movie about Charlie Grady. <laughs> they really, really should. And the, the funny thing is, is when we, he came over the first time I met him, he stopped over the house and he said, oh, I was at a house, I think across the street. It ended up, he was at my house 15 years ago. Our daughters were friends all through school. <laughs> oh God, that's crazy. And we didn't know it. <laughs> and my husband remembered him. In a small and, world. Yeah, my husband said, don't you remember? We didn't like them. They were the ones that always stood in front of us <laughs> in them quarter. <laughs> I, lo I love him. He's such a wonderful, beautiful person. So he created what is called Hang Time and Her Time. Right. And from Hang Time and Her Time, which are support groups yep. in person, he then created Connecticut Hall of Change, which the state of Connecticut inducts eight people every year who are just disimpacted and have changed their life completely for the better and are doing great things for Connecticut or um, hopefully in other states as well. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's fantastic. And then they even have you go and, and speak and do, and I, I just, I, I just love the idea. And I, he's, you know, he was telling me that he's talking about trying to get into Maryland and into Illinois and, and hopefully it can, and it can really become a national really, organization. Wow, yeah. When I tell you, Brent, when, when I got the award, we were at this big theater in Hartford, Connecticut called the Webster. And it was packed and I was ready to go up. And Charlie goes, I just want to let you know that your sentencing judge in the state is there. The, the state's attorney, the U.S. attorney is here. And I thought, well, you didn't tell me that before. And yeah. I had no idea really what it, how large it was. So I, I never prepare anything when I speak mm -hmm. anywhere because I like to try and just speak from what's inside. Yeah, authentic. So I got up and I stood there and I said, well, this really threw me for a loop. My sentencing judge, Janet von Archerton, is here today, and the U.S. attorney is here today. And I said, I do want to say thank you to her. And because everything went quiet when I said my sentencing judge. Sure. And then I said, I want, I don't think they expected me to say thank you. But um, I said she was very fair and she said what I needed to hear. And I think that it's difficult for another woman to be sentencing a mother. And my three mm -hmm. kids spoke at my sentencing. So it had to be, and through my, through my journey, getting my master's in criminal justice, I learned that secondhand trauma is a real thing for these judges and prosecutors and it's tough for them. And people think it's not. And then I looked at the U S attorney. I said, I'm not saying anything to you because I'm afraid of you. <laughs> and then I said to Charlie, I said, I really hope Charlie wasn't one of the FBI guys that read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I, too much. I mean, what can you say at that point? You have to just kind of make kind of. You got to roll with it. Yeah. It, it congratulations on that, though. I mean, that's that's a uh, huge yeah. accomplishment, and it's it's uh, quite a panel that 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 goes through and vets this out, and it's a yeah. real honor. Connecticut does, and they did the Impact Award, which was amazing. They do these awards in Connecticut that would not normally allow people 
to feel they're making a difference. Fox mm -hmm. 61 and um, the United Way did a Connecticut Impact Award, and I was a finalist on that. And the people I was in the room with, and it was a huge ballroom, yeah. and it was amazing the people that I was finalist with. Yeah. And I, no, I mean, I, I read up on it. I, I think, I think it's, it's an incredible honor. You should be very, very proud of yourself. And I just hope that this is something, and I, I think, you know, Charlie Grady is the type of guy that can get it done, um, that we see this over and over and over in every state, because I think it, it makes people uh, feel good about what they're doing, if they're doing good things. And that's a great yeah, thing. Yeah. And especially when life, it's not, it's not even, I don't think that life makes us feel bad. It's people make us sure. feel bad yeah. and feel less than. And when yeah. you make really poor choices or you have an addiction or you have any kind of thing that steps out of what we society considers norm yeah. is judged. Sure. And I really am proud of the state of Connecticut for what they are, what they have done in. Yeah, they're a model state. They really yeah. are. I, I really, I'm I really am impressed with Connecticut that. after all, you know, I've talked to people in different states. All Michigan's another state that, yeah. that does a lot. Yeah. So Jacqueline, you know, I always ask people this and I, you know, you've gone through so much and you're doing so much. What do you think is your biggest takeaway from all this that you've gone through? No one's ever asked me that, but you know what it is? It's to cherish my family more mm and not worry about being judged. And when I do things, do them for myself. I never did anything for myself. And I, I put the people I loved last because mm. everything else was so important and knowing they're going to be there often, yeah. we know they're going to be there. So often we'll just put that aside. Well, we'll do that tomorrow. We'll do that tomorrow. I don't do that anymore. I'm a, I'm a new grandmother and I go see my granddaughter and that's it. That's and awesome. My son's in New York. He's a musician. I go to every performance. Yeah. Um, you don't want to waste any time. You know yeah, what's important. Yeah, that's I mean, that's great. It's great advice. That is great advice. Yeah, that's that's I a think. great takeaway because family is it, and that is your success. Yeah. And and you want to take it all in as much as you can, whenever you can. Yeah. Now, there, I, I, there's still times where I think you know, uh, just to the family's around there's just me silently thinking i'm just so glad i'm here because i wasn't right. at one point yeah. yeah and the thing is you know what Brad? i used to think my family when i said my family i wouldn't think of my husband and kids first mm. i always thought of my mother and father mm -hmm. and my brothers yep. and that was my family yeah but now i mean my my parents will be married 65 years this wow year, and they live in our in-law apartment not, and not everybody's married 65 years. i know right they're so dear to me but my family is my husband yeah. my children my granddaughter and then my parents and i'll always take i mean parents are everything to me sure. but my husband deserves a little bit of kudos now and uh, he yeah. deserves the time so. Yeah, he's been there all the way through. That's oh, it's, it's funny. Awesome. Whenever I go on Google and I Google myself to see, the number one thing that comes up is who is Jacqueline Pulvari's husband? And I guess <laughs> I'm like, really don't think you'll ever see my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So speaking of Googling, what's the best place for people to get a hold of you? How do you um, get in touch with Jacqueline? Yeah, it's just um evolutionreentry at gmail.com. Okay. And our website, Evolution Reentry. Great website. Dot, yeah, it really dot org. We just switched to the dot org. We just became a nonprofit, yeah. um, which is which is wonderful. I'm happy about that. That's and, awesome. Uh, rolling out our home ownership program. That is the big deal this year. That's and, a huge deal. And yeah. um, you know, having a place for people to live and have something uh, and own something, and and you being involved in that is 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 uh, yeah. important work. Yeah, a home. That's what. It's, a home, not some place you're renting, but it's, it's your place. Yeah. I mean, you know, I do title searches all the time, but when you're seeing foreclosed properties empty yeah. everywhere for years and they're not being used, but we have a housing crisis. Wow. Let's get together and talk about that. So we're doing our first home in March. I'm really excited to awesome. be able to. I hope that's that something that just grows and grows and duplicates because yeah, that's so hopefully. needed. So needed. Jacqueline, thanks so much. I, uh, uh, shout out to uh, Homestead Financial here that 
offers me to be in this great uh, podcast room. And if anybody needs home mortgage needs, it's Greg Eftia. If he's your guy, um, if you're looking for a book, go to my place at Nightmare Success on Amazon. I love, you know, if you like this show, follow, subscribe, like, comment, leave reviews on Apple. Go to brentcasty.com. I spell it wrong. It's with a T-Y, not a D-Y. <laughs> Sean and David never showed up at my house and said we're all brothers. I was always wanting that. <laughs> um and as i used to say when i was uh, writing my emails back and forth from love and War, stay strong i'll do the same jacqueline thanks so much for taking time out today i'm so proud of all the stuff that you're doing it's thank awesome thank you so much brent for having me this is really great it was great seeing you you know you talk to people but you don't see them <laughs> <laughs> you don't see them here we are i know nightmare success in and out thanks everybody <laughs>